what forgiveness is not next. The program you are about to watch is part of a free series we are making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries entitled Forgiven. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s and watch the streaming video for free by entering code FREE at checkout. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We are coming to the end of our series on Forgiven. And if you have not uh, been watching or listening to this series, I want to encourage you to get it. It's free of charge. You can get the audio MP3 downloads or you can stream the video. Go to our website to the free download section and, and, uh, and follow along on this teaching. It's just, I really have enjoyed it. I've been able to get into some different aspects of forgiveness that I've never seen before. And we've also got study notes. You want to get your copy of these. They're free of charge on the study notes uh, tab on the home page of the website. Um, and you can create your own home Bible study. You can get the study notes and then stream the videos and have an entire uh, 15 sessions on the subject of forgiveness. And I do want to do this. We're going to, we're going to continue in teaching on seven things that forgiveness is not. But... Before we get into that, and we'll recap that, I just wanted to make mention of the books that we have. You know, um, I don't consider myself a writer. I've been traveling and speaking in churches and Bible schools for 30 years of my very short life. And um, uh, I never had a book until just a few years ago. I wrote this book, and uh, since we've started this program, man, these uh, we've been putting so many things into print as well you know we have the study notes but, but we've got articles and then we've started printing books this one was my first book it's good news it's on redemption and uh, I'm real happy with this book uh, I taught a year on this program from the contents of this book uh, the first year uh, we had this program and then this one is was my next book it's called living with no regrets and it's deals with getting over the past there's a lot of good material in this book as well. And then I wrote this book. Um, I sat down and wrote this one um, really just by hand, which there's nothing more intimidating for me as a speaker than to sit down with, in front of a blank page and have to fill it. And uh, so, but I did that uh, with this book as well, and it's called Living in Stressful Times Without Losing Your Mind. And uh, it's full of of a, a lot of teaching on developing spiritually and, and refusing to allow anger and fear to control your emotions. And then this is our newest book to date. It's called God Likes Faith. And it is an introduction to uh, the message of faith. I've taught a lot on faith on this program. We have more that, to get to when we're able to work it in. But that book is a great uh, overview of the subject of faith and why it's so important. And then this book is for non-believers. It's called Prepare to Meet Your Maker. And I've been sharing the contents of this book to churches uh, that I've been in lately. And they've been buying these by the dozen. I mean, this little book presents salvation to non-believers in a very logical, non-threatening way. And it covers all the details that a non-believer would need to know to, to get saved or you could give it to a new Christian and it explains exactly what happened to them when they when they accepted Jesus as Lord so I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk to you about uh, just the writing that we've done uh, I have not been sitting still since we started the good news program it just started a process of producing content that I've never had before we've done 25 audio series and they're uh, most of them are on our uh, our website. Some of them haven't been released yet, but um, and and then this one, of course, we're teaching on now is called "Forgiven or Not," and this is the audio series that goes along with these uh, TV programs. And you can find this on our website in CD or MP3. And one day, I'd like to make a book out of this series uh, because the subject of forgiveness is just so important. It's a cornerstone in the kingdom of God. If you're going to go on with God and, and be a healthy, strong believer, we've got to learn how to accept forgiveness from God, 
and we also need to learn how to forgive others. So it goes vertically and horizontally. But the, uh, so the doctrine of forgiveness, a very New Testament theme. Uh, it's a New Testament doctrine, but it's so important in our kingdom. Uh, it, I mean, it's so important that if you get it right and you allow God, you accept God's forgiveness of all your sins and you refuse to forgive someone else, it doesn't work in your life. So um, there's so much to that uh, subject that, that uh, is, is helpful. And um, man, you just don't want to be bitter and unforgiving in your life as a Christian. Not after all we've been forgiven of. It's just not right. So let me go over these seven points. Seven things that forgiveness is not. And I'm going to give you the seven again. Uh, and then we'll jump back in where we left off in our last program. But the seven, seven things that forgiveness is not. Number one, it's not evidence that sin is no big deal. Uh, sin is a problem. And it's a big problem. It separated the world from God. And without forgiveness, there's no way back. So thank God for forgiveness. Number two, forgiveness is not cheap even though it's free. And that's pretty self-explanatory. A huge price was paid uh, to purchase forgiveness for us, for the world. And even though it's given away freely, it wasn't cheap. And in fact, the only way God could get forgiveness to us, redemption to us, was, was to give it to us. He, he, he couldn't wait until we deserved it or earned it or paid Him for it because we would have never earned any thing. He, Jesus, it wasn't possible for Jesus to even pay half of the price or 90% of the price for our sins. We couldn't have paid the other 10. So in order for us to receive forgiveness, it had to be given freely, and it is, but it wasn't cheap. Number three, forgiveness is not just you ignoring the facts, mind over matter, pretending like it's not that bad or pretending like you never did anything wrong. That's not what we're saying. To accept forgiveness is to accept God's solution for the sin problem because He solved it. He paid for it. He, 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 he removed it. And when we accept forgiveness, we're not ignoring what we've done and acting as if we hadn't done it. We're accepting God's solution. And there's a big difference. And number four, uh, salve, or forgiveness is not just God ignoring the facts. It's not just God saying, I'm going to sweep it under the rug and I'm going to act like, I, I, know, I know what you did, but I'm going to just ignore it and I'm going to receive you anyway. That's not, that's not forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is, is God dealing with our sin and revealing the fact that there is a sin problem and dealing with it head on and solving it, not ignoring it. And there, there's a difference in that as well. And so number five, we'll start there today. Forgiveness is not proof that God doesn't care what you do. And, and this is very important because uh, anything taken to the extreme can become, uh, can become bad. It can, it, it, it can become false doctrine. And people do this with forgiveness and grace. And I, I want to, we, we need to strike the proper balance here. Uh, just because you're forgiven of your sins, and let's just be honest, if you go out today and do something wrong, uh, God is going to forgive you. You're, in fact, it's already paid for. You're already forgiven. So, I mean, that's the truth of the matter. If you were to, uh, to go out and steal a, pe a, a candy bar from, the, from a store, God will forgive you of that. But the fact that He forgives you doesn't mean that He doesn't care what you do. That's not what God is saying or the message that He wants to be communicated. And I have a real problem with people that are always trying to push the boundary and see what they can get away with. That is abusing the, the, the whole doctrine of forgiveness and it makes me wonder uh, what kind of Christianity these people really have received. Because I'm a Christian and, and I don't have a sinless life. But the last thing I want to do is go out and I am not planning to sin. That's not, a, and I don't 
if you listen to your heart, you don't want to go out and sin. That's not something that you, you, you desire. Uh, I read this, and I'm going to read it again, Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. This is Paul's sermon in Athens. He was preaching to idolaters, idol worshipers. In fact, they worshipped everything. Uh, these, these philosophers and these religious people in Athens. And so they listened to Paul, and here's what he said. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. That would be Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. But the point here is that, that now God commands everyone to repent. That doesn't mean accept forgiveness and then go do what you want. Repenting is to turn away. It's to change your direction. And, and a, a, a person who, who is a sinner and receives Jesus should change. Their actions should change. They should change their way. They should change their direction. Their, their habits should change. God's not offering forgiveness and then giving you the, the freedom to just go live like the devil. That's, that's not um, what forgiveness is all about. Living right is now possible because of the new birth. Each and every Christian has the ability. They have God living in them. They can live righteous. They can live a holy life. Now, we're not trying to live a holy life to get God to love us or to bless us. Uh, we already know that that's not the purpose. We live holy because we are holy. We live a righteous lifestyle because we are righteous. We're not trying to earn points with God, but that is the outworking of what's in us. When Paul says, put on the new man and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and walk in the spirit and not in, after the flesh, he's telling us to let the, the new creation person inside of you dominate your actions. And that's not going out and living in sin. You know, people who, who have this question and this mentality, how much can I really do and still go to heaven? How, many, how much wrong can I do and still go to heaven? This goes along with this Baptist doctrine of, they call it, once saved, always saved. And, and they've taken that to mean that it doesn't matter what you do. Well, I just want to say this. God loves you no matter what you do, but it does matter what you do. You will suffer the consequences of sin if you persist in wrongdoing. And that doesn't mean that God's out to get you and that He's going to punish you and come and get you and... And, and arrest you if you get into sin. But it does open the door for the enemy. It opens the door to all kinds of problems in your life, all kinds of emotional problems and, and, and physical problems. and It just makes you a target when, when you go out and persist in wrongdoing. I mean, that's what John said in 1 John 1, 7. If you walk in the light as He is in the light, that simply means that you don't have to walk in the light, and some Christians don't walk in the light. They choose to walk in darkness or walk in sin or live in ways that are contrary to God's Word and God's boundaries that He's laid out. When that happens, when you persist in that, then things go wrong. And it doesn't mean that God's out to get you. So when people talk about once saved, always saved, and they use that as an excuse to sin, in my opinion, these people haven't really been saved to begin with. They have some kind of a mental conversion or an intellectual walk with God, but it's not a real spiritual rebirth. Because when a person is born again, they become the righteousness of God. God is righteous. God is not trying not to sin to be a good, so He could be a good example to us. God doesn't get up every morning and, and resist temptation, wish He could do things that He's not able to do because He's God and He's got to serve as a good example to the rest of us. And he wants to be a bad God, but you know His conscience won't allow Him. 
He's, he's confined by rules that he's made and he's having to live within it. He, that's not true. God is who he is. He lives a righteous existence because he is righteous. He is a holy God. When you become born again, he puts his nature in you. So when that happens on the inside of us, we don't have any more desire to sin than God does. We have no more desire to break the law, the laws of God, the commands of God, than He has Himself. Why? Because He put His nature in us. Another way that it says this is He wrote His laws in our heart. So you don't have a bunch of commandments to follow. He wrote His laws. He just made you what He wanted you to be. So that we aren't interested in seeing how much sin we can get away with. In fact, the New Testament is totally the opposite of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, God told them in no uncertain terms, you cannot do this. You can't get away with this. And He gave them rules and regulations. In the New Testament, we are so different. We've been so changed on the inside. And we are the, the righteousness of God in Christ. We are new creations. We are His workmanship created in His image on the inside, that in the New Covenant it's different. In the New Covenant, the message is you can be as holy as you want to be. You can live the most righteous life you want to live. You can go as high as you want to go in God. There are no limitations. You now have the ability to live for God. Go make the most of it. So the New Testament is not even dealing with the bare minimum. We're not even trying to keep people from killing one another by saying, Thou shalt not kill. You know, don't kill anybody today. I know you want to, but don't do it. No, it's so different than that now. We have access to God. We can literally go into the presence of God and talk with God Almighty. The same God in the Old Testament who, who stayed on top of a mountain and there was thunder and lightning and the people were so afraid of God that they told Moses, you go talk to God and just tell us what He said. We're so, we're so far separated from God that we don't even want to hear His voice. We're so unworthy and so unholy and our lifestyles are so bad. We want you to hear His voice and just tell us what He said. And then when Moses came down the mountain from, from the presence of God, his face shone and they couldn't even stand that. N not only could they not take being in the presence of God, they had a hard time being in the presence of someone who was in the presence of God. And they put a, a veil over his face so Moses didn't scare them. Amazing. We've come so far now. We've been so changed that for a Christian to ask the question, can I do this and still go to heaven? Can I sin and will God forgive me of this? Will this keep me out? Of it's, it, it's so foreign that I question whether those people have really been saved or not. And, and if they are saved, they are so out of touch with their inner person that, that I mean, a person like that's not going to bear any fruit. How in the world can you bear fruit for God? when you're looking for ways to contradict and, and live uh, opposite of the way God has told us to live. It's just, uh, it, but it's important to cover all these bases because people really do say these things. So the question once, or the statement once saved always, people ask you that all the time, <laughs> you know, at least me. They'll say, what do you think about once saved, always saved? And, and I have a couple of responses. One is, I'm saved and I'm going to stay saved. I'm saved and I'll always be saved. There's no question about it. The question is, I'm not sure that, that, that everybody who says they're a Christian was really saved to begin with. So I would say it's more likely rather than once saved, always saved is not saved, never saved. I don't know that they were ever saved. So let's go back to square one and let's go to the altar and let's get saved and let's make sure we're saved. And then let's go from there because the, the question, what all can I do and still go to heaven? And, is, and, and if I'm once saved, will I always be saved no matter what I do? You're looking in the wrong direction. So that's my, um, that's my take on that. And I know that was a long, that was a long explanation, but it's, it, it's very important that 
that uh, we put things in proper perspective and and encourage people to live right. Like I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with living right. And and if you think living right and doing right is legalism, then then you, you really haven't read the New Testament. Uh, we don't do right or else. We do right because we are right. We do right because we want to do right. We want to live like God. We want to, We want the things He wants. Now, the flesh can get distorted we can't go after the lust of the flesh and uh, and that's another series another subject that that I won't get into but obviously the flesh has desires that are not consistent with the spirit but we must allow our spirit to override the lust of the flesh and if we'll do that we'll find ourselves doing what God expects and and it's not a burden it's a privilege all right now go to John chapter 8 I want to read this John chapter 8 and verse, um, oh, let, this is the woman caught in adultery. And I'm not going to read through this. I did a whole teaching on this in this series. And I really wish you would get the whole series and listen to it. Uh, because this was a major uh, part uh, in the first half of the series was the woman who was caught in adultery and how Jesus brought in a, a radical new way to deal with sin. Uh, they expected him to vote to stone her, and he forgave her. And nobody, could, nobody saw that coming, and, and, and not even the woman saw that coming. But once he forgave her, what he said was very, very telling and, and very in, instructive. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of, your, of yours? Has no one condemned you? And what had happened was Jesus said, He that is without, yeah, she should be stoned. Obviously, she sinned. She was caught. She didn't deny it. She should be stoned according to the Old Testament law. So he didn't deny that. He just said, He who is without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> and so um, that kind of... Um, thinned out the crowd. They all sort of went away from the oldest to the youngest. They all found something else to do that day. Because the point is this. Everyone needs forgiveness. Here they were judging her and they needed forgiveness too. And he's just making the point that you're all in the same boat. She may be an adulterer, but you're proud and you're a liar and a thief. And so whatever, you know, they all had their sins. And, and, and in God's mind, everybody needs forgiveness, not just her. They all did. So uh, when they walked away, she, Jesus asked her, where are your accusers? And she says, well, there's no, there's no one. And Jesus said this, neither do I condemn you. He didn't say, it's not so bad what you did. I understand why you did it. You were in a bad marriage. He didn't make excuses. He didn't say that she didn't sin. He didn't say adultery wasn't terrible. What he did say was, I don't condemn you. And then he said, go and sin no more. I love that. He's not excusing her. He's forgiving her. He's not giving her a license to go do it again. He didn't tell her to go tell everyone what she had done and, and become an advocate for you know, chastity in marriage. He, he didn't say that. He said, he, he said, go, live your life, and don't ever look back on this again. Sin no more. Don't repeat it. And so uh, forgiveness is not proof uh, that God doesn't care what you do. God's desire for you is the same as His desire for this woman and the rest of us. Go ahead. He's not condemning you. He's forgiving you. But go and sin no more. Take this opportunity to live for God and to live your life for, uh, for God, 100%, all in. And, you know, let me just say this. Uh, I'm teaching on forgiveness now, and we got lots of other series to come. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going anywhere. This program is, is in place for you and it's in place because God put me. I never planned to be on TV or to do some kind of TV program. That was never in my 
heart to do. I like preaching to people, basically. I, I'd rather preach to people, but in this climate, I can reach so many more people in front of this camera, and I've come to truly love it. You know, uh, the camera doesn't go to sleep when I preach. It doesn't boo me. It doesn't get up and walk away. So there are some positive aspects to preaching to you through a camera. But, uh, but, but the Lord has ordained this, and I, I believe that. And I'm not going anywhere till He tells me to. And it is one of the, the greatest honors, privileges of my life. I never saw myself at this point, uh, in this place at this point in my ministry, but I see it now. And to be here with you, to help you, to walk through this crazy world, as I watch the news, same as you. I may not comment on it uh, and, and, and make predictions and speculate on, on everything that's going on, but I know what's going on. I know what you're dealing with. I deal with it too. But I've chosen to take the things that will change your life, that will feed you, that will cause you to overcome in this world, and, and give that to you on a consistent basis. I try very hard to make every program worth the, the time and effort you put into watching it. I want it to be at a certain level, have a certain amount of word in it, a certain amount of, uh, of anointing and unction so that anytime you take time to sit down and watch the Good News program, you're going to be fed, you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be propelled. We're going to do this together. And as long as you want to be there, I want to be here. And I'll pray and seek God and I'll give you what He gives me. And I believe together we're going to walk into the future and reach a lot of people. So just, I said all that to say this, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad we're doing this together and I can't imagine not having this outreach at this point now since it's been five years. And, uh, and, and I believe the best is yet to come. Well, don't miss the rest of this teaching. We just have three more episodes. You don't want to miss it. And uh, so be with us on the next program. Until then, remember this. The good news is so good, the bad news doesn't matter. Are you completely forgiven or not? In this series, you'll learn incredible truths revealed in God's Word about the doctrine of forgiveness so you can say goodbye to guilt and shame. To order your copy of this series, call our helpline at 918 918- 749-7744, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. I got Greg Fritz's Good News book and Living With No Regrets. When I looked at this, I thought, you know, God wants us to know how much He loves us. He wants to show us His love constantly. And what better news is that? You can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. And when I heard Mr. Fritz talk, it was like he was talking to me. Um, I just knew there was stuff that the Lord wanted me to let go of and deal with. We need to find new ways to get the Word into our life. We ought to find ways to put it on our devices. We need to read it. We need to keep it before our eyes. We need to meditate on it. These things are are the things that will change your life. GregFritz.org offers many free resources on a variety of topics, such as how to let go of your past, live worry-free, hear God's voice clearly, and receive God's best in your life. Visit GregFritz.org to download free teachings that will change your life today.